I, I can only agree with, with what has been said earlier. And notably, if you, to answer your question, if you consider the context we're, we're living in, obviously we, are, we have entered an era which could be described as a new cold cyber war with a few strong nuances. Uh, during the Cold War, we were basically talking about a confrontation between two sides, which is not the case anymore. We're living in a multipolar world in which basically every state every state, even those who appear as probably the less prepared, can actually act in the cyberspace in an offensive way. Two, during the Cold War, confrontations were never direct. It's not the case anymore. Uh, cyber attacks are direct, and the confrontation is direct. Three, and I revolve back to my first point, we are not talking only about public entities, governments, we're talking about private entities, legitimate, illegitimate, who can be active. And when I was evoking those governments who may appear as not prepared to act, well, the thing is, they can always rely on competencies that are here on the market. And uh, being uh, patriotic hackers, being uh, corsairs, being mercenaries, all of them are available, provided you can pay for them. Um, so what we've been seeing in, in the last years is that we've made some great progress, and, and you said that at the, the group of governmental experts, and I, I happen to be the French expert, and I have, we have with us today uh, our Dutch colleague and, and friend who is the, the Dutch uh, expert at the DG. So Yes, we've uh, acknowledged, acknowledged the fact that uh, um, international law is fully applicable to the cyberspace, which is a huge step. Uh, second, we've managed to uh, conceive and establish a few norms of behavior that are, we believe, extremely useful for the future. So, of course, the question is now, how do we make sure that those norms are actually implemented. Well, that's for another century. Um, this was off the record. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but what is sure, <laughs> we're going to work on from now on. Uh, the thing is, we are probably in a situation where we need to change the ways we work on those topics. Uh, and we have welcomed welcomed uh, Microsoft uh, initiatives. We've organized with our Microsoft, Microsoft friends and, and some other countries an event back in, septem in September on the margins of the UN General Assembly on how we can better define the role and responsibilities of, of all the actors when it comes to uh, cybersecurity. Uh, what has been evoked, I can only concur with that. You know, How do we make sure that we prevent proliferation of cyber weapons. Uh, that is key, but also very difficult because basically the whole world would be happy to uh, get those weapons. Uh, how do we make sure that uh, the monopoly of constraint remains in uh, the arms of governments? Meaning how do we prevent uh, behaviors such as reverse hacking from private actors, and this is absolutely key for us. And how do we make sure that the digital battlefield in a way sort of disappears in the future? How do we make sure that every actor makes its best efforts to uh, work, to better work on security? And by saying that, of course, we're talking about uh, uh, softwares, devices, we've seen what happened with, with Intel a few weeks ago, but also IoT, mm -hmm. uh, and we need to take care of that too. So I may stop here because uh, I could stay for a long time on this topic. <laughs> <laughs> we, we will have a chance to come back to it, I, I'm sure. Uh, Laura, maybe I could turn to you next. Um, you know, a lot of the discussion that we've had so far has re revolved around, you know, the cyber attacks we've seen uh, and things of this nature. Uh, and, but there was also some reference to a kind of broader use of information warfare, in mm -hmm. a sense, disinformation. 
uh, fake news, but also other things that are aimed at uh, destabilizing societies and in interfering with democracy in a, in a f fundamental sense. And I'm, I, I know you're very active in this. I was wondering if you could say a few words about how you see this fitting into this overall picture. Yeah, so I think it's absolutely all part and parcel of the same thing. I think um, Brad characterized um, the way that some of these tools interact with each other. I think they're actually not um, separate tools. Cyber attacks um, often, as, as you referenced, um, facilitate information warfare when hacked information can be weaponized and released. Um, but I also think to, to take a step back to um, you know, the kinds of attacks that um, we saw with NotPetya and WannaCry um, also are very much related to attempts by authoritarian nations that have an interest in undermining faith in democratic institutions. And Brad, you underscored um, very clearly that you know, one of the important roles of the public sector is to protect the public from foreign nation state attack. And when we see the ability of um, adversarial nations to use cyber attacks to undermine the electric grid, to um, take out hospital systems. These are also things that undermine people's faith in government's ability and democracies to provide for the good of the people. And so I think these are very much sort of part and parcel of the same thing. I totally agree it's a shared responsibility to address these issues. There's a role for governments, there's a role for the private sector, there's a really important role for civil society. I think on both the cyber security side and on the information warfare side, a lot of what we see is the exploitation of vulnerabilities in our systems and vulnerabilities in our societies. Um, so whether that's technical vulnerabilities that are being exploited for cyber means, um, or whether that are whether that is um, cleavages in our society um, that are being blown open through information warfare. Um, I think that in that sense, it's really important, both Rose and Brad really underscored the importance of resilience. And I think we need to think about resilience in a couple of different ways. There's the traditional sort of hardening of systems ways. Um, there's the um, securing of the actual technical pieces of equipment. Um, but then there are closing off some of the societal vulnerabilities that make um, some of these attacks much more um, impactful. Um, it's, it's in part, you know, there's, I kind of think about it, there's a supply side and there's a demand side. And you have to think about it from, you have to address the vulnerabilities on, on both sides of that um, in order to be able to, to really address the challenge. Um, Rose, you mentioned um, some of the t technologies that are coming down the pike, AI in particular. This is an area where when we think about information warfare in particular, um, I have major concerns. The technology already exists, I mean, the kind of quote, fake news, um, disinformation stories that we've seen prevalent not just in the US, um, but across the European continent, um, or will, will sort of, um, uh, you know, the new technologies are gonna blow out of the water in a way, um, what we see coming down. So the ability to manipulate video and manipulate audio and create whole new, you know, content that appears indistinguishable um, from something that is that is real um, is is really terrifying, and how we how we begin to address that, we need to. It's not just that we need to be um, deal, you know dealing with the challenges today with with not the tools of the past. We also we need to be anticipating the challenges of tomorrow, vulnerabilities that are going to be coming down the pike. Um, and then I just want to echo, I think, um, again on both the information warfare side as well as on the the um, cyber attack side, this idea of the importance of attribution, exposure, I think of it in terms of sunlight and transparency, which in any functioning democracy is incredibly important. Um, and I think it's important to both accountability, it's important to, to building resiliency. Um, so to me, I think that these are all very much related and it's really important that we think about them um, as sort of an integrated toolkit that we um, both need to be thinking about, understanding analytically and, and being able to address. Laura, thank you. Uh, Rose, uh, you know, we talked a lot about, you've all in different ways talked a lot about defense and defenses and hardening and hardening society and mm -hmm. so forth. Beyond defense, is there also a place for deterrence in this? Oh, I think absolutely. We have some examples uh, that at least I've read about in the press. Uh, people talk about uh, what has gone on, um, and this was rather uh, now an old story, but uh, but uh, during the previous administration in the United States, the approach that was made uh, to the Chinese after attribution had occurred to say, cut it out. 
and apparently, at least according to press reports, uh, it did have some effect. So I do think that there is a role for deterrence, but if you are going to exercise um, deterrence, then as always, you have to be strong. That's what we talk about in NATO when we talk about deterrence and defense. You have to be strong, you have to be well prepared, you have to be well trained and exercised, you have to be ready, able, to defend yourself, and that has to be evident to uh, your uh, your counterpart, to your to the possible aggressor, as as we say. So I wanted to just mention and uh, and to pick up on some of the points that Laura made. Uh, a visit I had last week to the Stratcom Center of Excellence uh, in in Riga, Latvia. I was visiting uh, there last week. I had a chance to see the battle groups both in Latvia and Lithuania. That's a great example of how deterrence and defense in physical space, the kind of old-fashioned old way, is very present in NATO. But then I went to the Stratcom Center of Excellence in Riga, and they had some very important things to say about be trained, be ready in order to contribute to a deterrence effect. One thing they talked about is being um, very ready to get out there first with the right information in order to dominate the algorithm. Um, and I think I, they are very concerned, as you are, Laura, about the, the, um, the advent of technologies that will allow, uh, allow manipulation of files and information so that it really looks real, uh, news reports, films, et cetera, et cetera. They're very very um, concerned about that as well. But this notion of, of being out there first with good information and trying to get ahead uh, of the wave, I think, is, is one way to think about how to handle it. But also just, uh, I think, again, being prepared uh, and being ready to respond, being ready to respond quickly uh, in every way you can. So I do think there is a role for deterrence. There's no question about it. But in some ways, the uh, link is back to how we've always thought about it, Know thy enemy, so understand what the enemy can do, what, what the threat is, and then be strong and prepared to deal with it. Brad, you spoke, uh, and there's been a great deal of debate about this, especially in the context of, of the work that you've been doing on a digital Geneva Convention, this question of enforcement. You know, if you, if you go the route of legal regimes, uh, how enforceable and who will enforce them? Um, how, how are you thinking about that problem? Or is it perhaps not so much about that, it's simply about the norm setting and enforcement is great too. But uh, say, a, say a word about that. Well, I think both aspects are important. And I think from our perspective, especially as a private company, um, the, the first principle for us is there need to be clear rules. Um, you, know, you can think about any issue of arms techno technology and there are always important questions. You know, are they enforceable? Who will enforce them? Um, you know, is anything, you know, ironclad? I mean, we live in a world of laws, and yet there is still crime, and therefore we apparently live in a world where every day people break the law. And so sometimes I find people ask, well, gee, if we make these laws, can we rest assured that everyone will obey them? Um, no. <laughs> That's the short answer. But I think, to me, the first question is, are we better off in a world with law than without it? Uh, and I think, uh, to me, I'd look at the issues that have arisen around chemical weapons. You know, chemical web weapons have been broadly prohibited by international law going back to the late 1800s. And yet Mussolini used them in East Africa in the 1930s and denied it for a year before the governments of Western Europe concluded that, in fact, they had been used. And even in our own day, in recent years, there have been questions about the use of chemical weapons in Syria. And so you know, some of these fundamental questions that make attribution difficult in cyberspace are also sometimes attributed, are sometimes present in, in those kinds of issues as well. You then get to the same question. If a government has used chemical weapons, they clearly have violated international law. Uh, who is going to accept the responsibility to enforce the law against that perpetrator? Sometimes it's the United Nations. Sometimes it's an individual government. Sometimes it, it, it's NATO. Um, I think as one gets to those questions, one frankly exceeds what I regard as the role of a private company to try to divine. I think that this is where the intergovernmental organizations, where the governments themselves need to really address you know, that question. But from our vantage point, 
it all starts with having clear rules and laws in the first place. Yeah. Thanks. Um, before I open up to all of you, maybe I could just uh, put a, a final question from my side to, to the four of you or whoever wants to pick up on it. Uh, and forgive me from GMF's transatlantic perspective, I can't help asking this, but do you, do you have the sense that Europe and the United States are on the same page with these questions? I mean, perhaps about the assessment of the risk, but you know, the question of what to do about it. Um, yes. Good. Well, <laughs> I, I was Thank you. I was in Washington last week to, to conduct the American-French cyber dialogue and, and yes. We're doing, we're doing very well. We're doing very well here. <laughs> I'm going to be a little more pessimistic over here. <laughs> not that I think it's uh, not fundamentally on the same page, but I do think there are differences both between the U.S. and Europe on how we think about things uh, like speech and privacy that do um, make for differences. <laughs> and then, th but I also think um, when we think about particularly sort of hybrid warfare and asymmetric tools, I think even within the European context, there is there are different views. There are different threat perceptions. There is a different sense in some places of how we should be prioritizing certain threats versus others and how to be addressing them. And so I'm very hopeful in the transatlantic spirit. I mean, I think there is no question we need to be on the same page. Let me put it that very clearly. We, we need a transatlantic approach to these issues. We need, uh, you know, I mean, Brad, you talked about a global approach. I think that that's right. I, th I think as a starting point, getting at least all democracies um, sort of on the same page on this is incredibly important. Um, but I do think there are some challenges to, to be worked through mm -hmm. on that. Mm -hmm. David, yeah, please. It, it, obviously, yes was the short answer. <laughs> um, so on cyber, we, we, have, we, we share the same goal. We share the same vision. Again, we acknowledged uh, the, the, the full applicability of, of international to, to the cyberspace. We, We've worked together on establishing the same norms of behavior. We approach them the same way, meaning we see them as lines that basically tells you who's, who's the right guy, who's the wrong guy. Uh, uh, we have some nuances, notably on, on the, the concept of deterrence. For example, we would rather use the idea of demotivation or disincitement because we see deterrence as so intimately uh, linked to uh, nuclear deterrence that it's a problem, it's a theoretical problem for us. We obviously, in cyber, we're not looking at erasing the enemy. Uh, we're not talking, again, we're not talking about a club. And uh, we are, again, not, and this is why it is so tricky. We are talking about attacks that are under the threshold of the use of force, really. Uh, even if, of course, the, array, the, 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 the perspective we're facing is probably human casualties in the future. And uh, so far, it hasn't been documented, even during, I don't know, during the black energy attacks in, in, mm. uh, in uh, Western Ukraine. Uh, basically, if you put down the grid in uh, regions uh, where, obviously, the winter is quite cold, you may suffer that kind of, of consequences. So far, it hasn't been documented. But obviously, the risk is there. And when we reach to that point, then the whole landscape will even evolve. Uh, and on the topics you evoked, yes, of course, we don't approach the question of disinformation, of fake news, the same way. Uh, and but this is just a, st a starting point. And uh, of course, the Americans have the First Amendment to the Constitution. We are not bothered that much about limiting <laughs> freedom of expression when it comes notably to terrorist contents or, or you know, that. So we don't approach the question the same mm. way, but, but basically, yeah, the, we're globally on the same page. Brad, well, please. I would say in some ways I think the U.S. and Western Europe are on the same page, and in some ways they're not. And, you know, I do think we've probably seen more progress over the last year but there's more, a lot more work that needs to be done. Um, one of the challenges is that this issue actually is multifaceted. Uh, you take something like uh, WannaCry. I mean, here was an attack that was indiscriminate, um, but at a time of peace. But I think you right. see a clear uh, consensus across, say, Europe and, and, and North America and even reaching into Japan. 
Uh, you take something like NotPetya, where views are emerging, as you just as you heard about uh, attribution. Um, you know, a, an attack that I would say was indiscriminate, but targeted at a single country. And again, I think you, you start to see views uh, that are more in common emerge. Uh, when you get to the issues around uh, democracy, and yeah, it, it, it may not be a, a cyber attack like WannaCry and, and, and NotPetya. We use terms like information warfare. I think if in some ways we're still groping for the right vocabulary even to use. I do think that we can look at these attacks and say they are attacks, and I do think we can say they are attacks on, on democracy. I also think that you know, the fundamental fact that everybody recognizes is that we're living in an unusual time. Because Washington, D.C. remains largely fixated across the political spectrum in a debate about what happened in the 2016 election. So here we are nine months away from a very important midterm election in the United States. Mm -hmm. And I think from our perspective and in a disconcerting way, people are still spending too much time looking backwards rather than forward. You know, we're seeing people who are up for re-election in November being attacked, hacked today. And I think the time has really come with a sense of urgency to find a way to look forward, even if people are going to continue to debate the past as they will and should. But it's time to, 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 to look forward. I also think that because there is this unusual uh, moment of time, say, in Washington, D.C., greater leadership is needed than in other times across Western Europe. Greater leadership is needed in Canada, where I think the Canadians benefit from really being the only uh, democracy that has a minister whose uh, sole role is the protection of, of democratic institutions. And Corinna Gould, who has that position, is very focused on how to protect the Canadian election that will happen in, in 2019. Um, but we are going to need, I think, you know, more, more steps in that space. And that area in particular is not one where I think the United States and Western Europe are moving together in tandem the way in most circumstances since World War II they have tended to. Okay. Let me open it up to all of you. Uh, we've got about oh, 25 minutes, a little less maybe. And if I could ask you to be quite, uh, quite crisp, that would be super. Tell us who you are and where you're from. Uh, that would help us out a lot. Let me start right here. Thank you very much. Uh, Nicholas Novaki, I'm a research officer from the Wilfrid Martin Center for European Studies. Uh, sticking to the topic of deterrence, um, it was an interesting discussion already, but I'd like to ask, uh, because deterrence to work, there needs to be quite a clear idea uh, uh, on behalf of the potential perpetrator that it would be punished somehow if there would be an attack. And I would like to hear some ideas of if how, for example, if there would be another wanna cry attack uh, eventually in the future, what could be done to uh, have a pretty, pretty clear punishment uh, for the potential uh, uh, perpetrator? So it might be uh, deterred. Mm -hmm. Please, well, I'd like to pick I'll up just on start that. by repeating an aspect of what I said. One aspect of deterrence is strong defense and a sense that your uh, uh, the perpetrator of the attack would not would not simply be able to gain his, uh, his objectives in the attack. So that's why we do emphasize resilience. At NATO, we emphasize the security of our networks, the security, uh, even if there should be a breach that we can recover very, very carefully. I can't agree enough with the point that Laura made that it's really uh, the responsibility of institutions everywhere to do everything they can to ensure that their networks if, if not being invulnerable to attack, at least can easily or quickly recover. Sometimes it's not so easy, but your, uh, there, the, the attacker is not deriving the effect he wants because simply the system is so resilient that it bounces back quickly. I, I'm oversimplifying, but you see what I mean? I wanted to make the case that deterrence is not only about, uh, about striking back all the time. Sometimes it can be making it very clear to the would-be attacker that they will not gain the effect they're looking for. Looking for. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, obviously you, you have to look to, to think about what you're really looking at. Uh, we're not looking at punishing the attacker. We, we're looking at making the attack stop and reestablishing a normal situation. So obviously uh, 
uh, yeah, the best defense is defense, which is uh, the best description of, of uh, deterrence by denial. And then second, what we would be looking at is really how to make the attack stop and how to raise the cost of an attack for the attacker. And so what means do we have uh, uh, in our hands? Well, uh, so this is still a, a, an ongoing discussion between governments. Uh, we would probably look at several tools, not necessarily cyber. Uh, yeah, and, and basically, it's the usual job of diplomats. We, we would then could act on, on you know, diplomatic aspects, economic, cyber, military. There are a lot of options. And probably the best answer would be a cross-border reaction. One thought I would add is I think that this is an area where it's very important to think about the different roles of, the gover of governments and the private sector. You know, from our perspective, deterrence is really the role of governments, organizations like NATO and others. It's, I don't think the world is served by private companies getting into the deterrence business. Uh, occasionally, there you hear suggestions that companies should be allowed to hack back. Um, and I think that's probably a recipe for more things to go wrong than be done right. Um, I do think that there is a special role and responsibility for the tech sector in particular to do an effective job as acting as first responders. Because that is, in fact, what we are. Um, we are the people who show up first to try to help people who have been attacked. And you know, we found it helpful to at least think a little bit about what can be learned from uh, how governments and civil society responded to the first really great advances in weapons technology in the middle of the 19th century. Um, in part, it led to the invention of the Red Cross. And sometimes people have asked me, do you think tech companies are now like the Red Cross for the internet? And the answer is no, we're not the, the Red Cross. I think there is a different analogy, though, that is interesting to think about. Because when the governments of Europe came together in Geneva, Switzerland in 1863, they did two things. They established the Red Cross, but they also said that medics, even medics who worked in uniformed armies, had to be protected as neutrals and had to take on the responsibility of neutrals. And what that meant, literally, was when there was a battlefield with weapons technology that was far more dangerous for all of the combatants than the world had previously seen, the medics had a responsibility to stay on the battlefield and treat the wounded. And they needed to treat the wounded regardless of nationality. That was the responsibility that came with being neutral. But the protection that they therefore deserved from militaries of all variety was that they medics would not be shot as they were treating the wounded. And I do think there is something to be said that in the world today, the cybersecurity engineers that work for tech companies and work for customers, they are the medics of the internet. And I think we have a responsibility to help everyone to treat the wounded. And I think that we can do that work only if governments accept that we have that responsibility and need the kind of protection that you know, has, has preceded us with other prior generations of technology. I'll just add 30 seconds to the very good remarks on this already. Um, the asymmetric nature of the way that we are seeing these, these cyber attacks being employed poses fundamental challenges to conventional deterrence theory. And I won't get theoretical on this crowd. But um, the, the point being that um, an adversary who is willing to launch um, high-risk, indiscriminate attacks um, is going to sort of fundamentally create challenges for how you respond um, as, as responsible nation states. And so um, I do think, as, as Ambassador Montagnon mentioned, you're thinking, of, thinking about our own, um, you know, across the full toolkit available to, um, to those who are under attack, thinking outside of just the cyber domain is incredibly important where we can think about the, the ways that we can impose 
costs um, and raise the cost for such a tax in a way that is still true to the rule of law, to the values um, that we seek to, to protect as well. Okay, let me go back. There are a lot of hands here and not a lot of time. Let me ask you, perhaps we could take a few together and, and come back to you to, to close it out. So, uh, maybe just right here and then in, just in back of you there. Thank you, yes. Um, Brooks Tigner Jane's Defense Weekly. Okay. Um, I have a question for uh, Rose Gottmiller primarily. Um, NATO MODs yesterday, as you know, agreed to reform NATO's command structure. A lot of this will involve um, prearranged, um, predefined arrangements to second or lend national capabilities to NATO. And yes, I know they also agreed to strengthen the cybersecurity center uh, in shape. However, I heard no talk about setting up predefined agreements to transfer national cyber capabilities over to NATO in times of crisis. So my two questions to you are, uh, given the urgency of the cyber threat, um, how much time should NATO give itself to do that? Um, and might that directly involve industry, or will it just be strictly gov to gov? And second question, should that particular predefined assignment uh, have priority over the more physical aspects of transferring you know, um, C2 commands in air support, et cetera. Thank you. Okay. Maybe perhaps just right here, if I could. If there's a microphone floating around. Um, do we have one? Well, while we're, is there one right, just right here? No? Okay. <laughs> Just right here, the lady with the red scarf. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Carmen Gonsalves. I'm the cyber coordinator in the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And would like to thank the panelists for their uh, wonderful uh, introductions and uh, the interesting discussion. For my part, I can only would like to start off by, by answering Brad Smith's uh, pertinent rhetorical question. Are we better off in a cyber domain where law applies? Well, definitely, we definitely are. I completely agree with you and that's why um, as the Netherlands we try to do our best to to spread the knowledge um, about uh, how international law applies to cyberspace internationally to foster the discussion also about how indeed it applies because it's a very important that we that we give it hand that we definitely operationalize that and furthermore indeed we are also trying to actively uh, engage in this discussion about how we can complement that with norms of behavior uh, that uh, plug the gaps, um, and um, we also very much uh, are aware of the fact that this is not something for states alone. Although governments traditionally have this, this, this um, responsibility and also monopoly on, in, 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 in international peace and security, it's definitely it is obvious that in, in cyber and in the digital world, we have to team up with private partners, with the tech community, with civil society. Um, and join in and be in that endeavor together. And that's why last year we um, were proud to help uh, establishing uh, the Global Commission on Stability of Cyberspace under the inspiring leadership of Marina Kallirand, former yes. foreign minister of, of, of Estonia, where indeed this discussion is, is actively um, 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 on track. Uh, what I would like to ask you indeed is uh, and, uh, about the following. Um, to ensure that there's more stability in cyberspace, we need to up resilience. Um, Ms. Gottemann already rightly underscored that. Resilience is important. Um, but when we look at the world, it's, it's obvious that apart from the front runners, there are many countries that don't feel resilient enough. There's a lot that we can do more in the area of capacity building. Uh, capacity building in the area of first line resilience, but also perhaps the capacity building in as, as far as uh, in, the, in the area of, of knowledge on international law and norms, etc. How can we better team up together states and private sector and others involved and bring that to the next level, capacity building worldwide. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. If I could go perhaps just right over here uh, on the aisle. Thank you. Thank you. Nadia Kovalchikova from Public Diplomacy at NATO. Uh, I have a question about the actors. So we, we usually understand cyber threats as part of hybrid threats who are coming from the uh, attackers who are in the weaker position, who are not able to wage a normal warfare. Um, and therefore, uh, they don't have enough money, but they have enough money to fund 
these cyber or hybrid threats. So would it be, in your opinion, a good idea to maybe follow the money, cooperate more with uh, financial institutions? And second, we have seen a lot of uh, very impressive and uh, uh, touching videos by people. So the people who feel vulnerable, who feel attacked uh, and unsafe uh, in this time, what, what role do you see of the civil society and academia in order to counter these uh, new threats? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And I think, uh, and I'm conscious of our time as well, I think probably have time for one more and then we'll come back to our panel here. Just right here, please. Th uh, thank you, Marius Kraut from Latin Permanent Representation in the, in the EU. Uh, thank you, thank you so much for your presentation and uh, for information given. And I heard your concerns about, uh, and the Dutch concerns, ha better having some role in place than no role, uh, than no law at all. But my my question was, you s you mentioned the Geneva Convention on on uh, hybrid threats. Uh, Geneva Convention, it means that uh, it's a humanitarian law convention. Uh, but humanitarian law applies only during the time of war, of war, of armed conflict. So, and if there is no war, if there is no declared war or not, threshold of violence reached, uh, there is no law applicable. i rather, rather th suggest you to stick to hum human rights law. It's, it's safer, they apply all the time. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, and thanks to all of you. My apologies, uh, I know there were a lot of hands out there, but I did want to save some time to come back uh, to the panel. So, lots of things here. Please feel free to pick up on any uh, that you would like very briefly. Um, question of sharing cyber capability in NATO, um, national capabilities in NATO and how to share them. Um, capacity building for resilience and norms. Uh, following the money, uh, the role of civil society and uh, what kind of law to apply and when. There's a lot there, but very briefly, without letting Brad miss his plane. <laughs> okay, well maybe I'll just Please. start because there was one Brad. question addressed to me quite specifically. And um, so I'll just take that one, then let my colleagues take the other ones. But you're making a big assumption about authorities and how authorities get used uh, around NATO in peacetime, in wartime. In the case of NATO allies, uh, some uh, authorities essentially are exercised on a national basis and uh, essentially something might be offered to NATO uh, to share. It goes for, you know, the cyber domain of operations I mentioned. No, maybe I didn't in this speech, but now we are looking at cyber as a domain of operations just as air, sea, and land. They're all domains of operation. But authority is uh, conveyed and used within NATO in various ways. Sometimes a state essentially offers up a capability and it is available for use in the alliance. Sometimes there are actually, and we are looking also, you pointed out quite rightly, at adaptation of the NATO command structure. And in that case, there will be more, more formalized uh, definition and then uh, articulation of authorities. And that process is still underway. In fact, our heads of state and government will be making some final decisions on that at the time of the July summit. So. Um, I uh, cannot answer your question precisely because it's very dependent on circumstances, but I did want to make you aware and the entire audience aware that this notion of how uh, authorities are articulated and then, uh, then uh, used in any particular cir circumstance, whether in conflict or in crisis, is, is dependent on um, the specific circumstances and de dependent very much on the, on the uh, substance of the situation. David? Well, I can give you the French position on that. The, the, we're, France is not ready to uh, put its uh, cyber capabilities in, 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 the, in the hands of NATO, but we are, uh, we are absolutely uh, prepared to uh, put them uh, into motion to look after the goals that have been defined by NATO. So the, the, here is the nuance. And by the way, we, we've been advocating a lot for the, cyber the NATO cyber pledge, because we consider that the best preparation is for every member state to actually commit to invest on, on, the, on the proper preparation. And exercise, and train, uh, yep. and be ready to, mm -hmm. to deal with circumstances that may be thrown at us. Or questions here you'd like to pick up on? Um, I would just um, say absolutely on following the money. Um, uh, one of the challenges um, 
uh, that actually uh, that David mentioned earlier in terms of the uh, the patriotic hackers in particular. Um, one of the things we see from some nation state actors, Russia in particular, um, is that um, sometimes it can be difficult on the attribution side um, to determine whether or not these are actors um, who are under the government direction, guidance, control. Um, uh, or whether they are sort of freelancers who are acting at the behest of. Um, there, are, there are networks um, that operate uh, both on the cyber side, um, the Cozy Bear and Fancy Bear networks are the most well-known when it comes to Russia. And in fact, those are, those are networks of hackers um, that are held together in some ways uh, on an official side and in some ways on a, on a less formal side. We've seen um, similar... Uh, uh, behavior at times in the past by certain um, Chinese entities, um, which may or may not be affiliated formally with the government or may sometimes work for the government or not. All of that to say that when you're trying to determine who is in fact being funded from where or getting direction from where, the money piece is incredibly critical both um, to, to understanding the, the networks, how they operate, and then being able to, to cut them off. I'd offer just a couple of thoughts, although with the preface that I think the questions that all of you have asked are really some of the most important questions for all of us to be thinking about, and they are challenging questions, and therefore there is no easy answer or definitive response from you know, a single panel. Um, I do think when one thinks about the public and private sectors working together on resilience, there's something to be learned from thinking about not NotPetya. Uh, because I think traditionally um, tech companies have focused on helping customers one at a time uh, because typically customers were hacked one at a time. Uh, typically organized criminal groups it do target individual consumers or companies uh, with a specific intent typically of financial gain and therefore one needs to work with a customer at a time. Um, but not Petcha showed that an entire country could be attacked simultaneously. WannaCry showed that the whole world could be attacked uh, simultaneously. And so you know, I think that there is an important opportunity for us to, to ask, okay, when an attack is unfolding, especially in real time, you know, what is the preparedness of the government and the role of the government? What is the preparedness of uh, the tech sector? Uh, and how do we work together you know, quickly the way a country or the world needs us to act? Uh, and that is a new level of resilience that we're going to have to establish. I think the other questions really underscore in so many ways the profound nature of the challenges that we're now confronting. And in some ways, these are not altogether new. I mean, these attribution issues are very challenging, but I, I sometimes think it's worth recalling uh, that when the first Nazi troops entered Poland in 1939, they were wearing Polish uniforms because they were designed to create a pretext for Hitler to claim that Germany was being attacked and needed to respond. So we've, in fact, you know, dealt with challenges of attribution for many, many decades. And now we just have some more sophisticated challenges of attribution that we need to address. But at the same time, the point about international humanitarian law is a really vexing one. Because here we have this body of law that says that governments must protect civilians in times of war, but it doesn't say they must protect civilians in times of peace. Why not? Well. It's peace, they don't need to be protected. Well, what are we living in today? I think that's where this word hybrid comes into in, in effect. Um, you can see these attacks take place as isolated incidents, as warning shots. No one really knows what the motivation was for WannaCry. I think someday the world may know, but it may be years before we get to the bottom of it, or at least have the kind of public information that would enable us to determine it. I don't know exactly what one calls what happened in Kiev on the 27th of June. It wasn't entirely isolated because there have been other military incidents clearly uh, in, in Ukraine since 2014. Um, you know, so we're living in a time that we're not quite certain how to label. And yet what we do know is that civilians need to be protected. 
And I think part of the answer is to follow the money. But I also think that a fundamental lesson for me is the role of civil society. And for this purpose, I will define civil society as anybody that's not in government and therefore claim to be part of it. If you look fundamentally at that question that Albert Einstein posed, how does humanity respond to advances in weapons technology so that humanity can organize itself to protect itself from the potential of horror, the horrors of war that otherwise will be unleashed? It has always been the voices, actually, of people in civil society. You know, it was Henri Dunant who mobilized public opinion by, in effect, giving a voice to the victims at the Battle of Solferino in 1859. And he did it through a book that was widely read across Europe. And so uh, that has been a course that has been followed many times. We wouldn't have laws today that would protect against landmines if there hadn't been a determined campaign by civil society. So I, I think that there is absolutely a role today for the groups in civil society that respond to these attacks, that protect civilians, that help customers. And you know, frankly, a big part of what led us to send people to Ukraine with a film crew was to ensure that the voices of victims could be heard. Because I don't think one can solve these problems in any meaningful way unless one mobilizes public opinion. And I don't think that one can mobilize public opinion fully unless we give victims the voices they need to have. And I think that's part of what I hope we can continue to carry forward. Please join me in thanking our speakers. This has really, this has really been an extraordinary conversation, and we're, we're very grateful uh, to all of you for, for helping us have this. Um, and thanks to all of, of you for joining us. Let me also just, uh, also not least, thank uh, Microsoft, John, your, and your wonderful team. And uh, if I may also permit me to thank my wonderful team, including Bruno Latte, who organized this for us. Um, it, this has really been a great conversation. I look forward to having others. And we also invite you to a reception outside. So thanks so much. <laughs>